Well, hello everyone. Um, welcome. This is the Academic Writer Studio. Thank you for tuning in. This is our very first live coaching Q&A, something we're hoping to make a monthly event where um, students, researchers, faculty, who's ever in our community can come and join us um, to ask um, live coaching questions, you know, to check in. So today I'm so happy to have um, one of my just wonderful colleagues that is a joy to work with, Rowena Robles, who is here with me as my partner in answering questions. Rowena, you can introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Rowena Robles. Um, I have, I finished my dissertation and me and Allison finished about the same time, um, 18 years ago. So it's kind of crazy. <laughs> That's exactly, and, I was 20 years ago. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Um, I think what I want to share is when Allison interviewed me to become part of the team, she described the job and I said, oh, I've been doing that for free for all my friends for years. <laughs> so I come naturally to this work. I really love it. And um, outside of that, I teach part time at the university level. I'm an education and ethnic studies scholar. And I also do a little bit of evaluation work for some organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thanks, Rowena. Well, you guys know me, I'm Allison. I'm the uh, founder and one of the co-owners of the Dissertation Coach. And now, the, along with my husband, uh, we're founding a, this new endeavor, the Academic Writers Studio, which is basically an academic productivity gym in a way with a really giant heart. So it is basically a um, co-working community that's done virtually over Zoom, where we come together to work in solidarity and experience you know, a sense of collective efficacy and actually learn how to cultivate um, a relationship with yourself so that you actually know how to support yourself through the challenges, the opportunities, and the very real ups and downs of, you know, getting a graduate degree, uh, pursuing a research career, being, you know, a professor, all of the challenges that come and how challenging it is often to actually get ourselves to do what we're really here to do, which is write. <laughs> you know, produce manuscripts, you know, um, engage in deep thought, innovate, and really fundamentally to learn and expand ourselves. So uh, we meet every week. We have multiple writing retreats, these two-hour meetings where we come together and we co-work together, and they are professionally facilitated by highly experienced writing coaches who've worked for the dissertation coach for many years. So one of the things that we wanted to start to offer, since in the writing retreats, we have these mainly 10 minute interactions in and around the 45 minute work periods, an opportunity for our community to come together and actually just ask questions, you know, so that if there's something that we've talked about in our writing retreats, which you'd like to go in greater depth, something we've talked about in the writing retreats where you haven't really been fully sure how to apply it to yourself, or you've experienced some shift or change in yourself and now you want more. Now you wanna know how to go deeper with it. Or you wanna just go more in depth as to, to a theme or an idea that you heard us speak about in the writing retreats. I mean, we've been doing dissertation coaching now for over 20 years. We've seen all kinds of situations. I don't know if Rowena and I will have a brilliant answer for everything you ask, but we certainly will make the effort to answer as wisely and succinctly so that we can get to as many questions as we want. Um, in this session, our focus is going to be more on what we would call coaching questions, more questions about the process of doing the work. Um, we won't be answering like highly technical statistical questions or you know, getting into the nitty gritty of content of work. So it's a more process focused. So anyway, um, I would be delighted if there's one of you that actually just wants to kick it off and ask, a, just ask an opening question. We do have some that we've already been submitted to us that we can go to, but I thought it'd be more fun for Rowena and I if we could just have sort of the challenge and the joy of spontaneously responding to a question that you have. So feel free to come off mute. You also can put the questions in the chat that Rowena and I are um, monitoring well to the best of our ability we will so feel free is there someone that would like to kick off and 
ask a question of Rowena and I that we will go back and forth and answer for you. And we can also, you can also stick it in the chat. We can sit and have a lovely awkward silence, which is also okay with me. And I can go to one of the questions. Would that be better if we warm up with one of my questions that I already have? Okay, all right, I see you, I see you nodding. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a question, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of summarize it so I don't read the whole thing. But my question is, are there ways to mitigate the criticisms from others from constantly invading your thoughts? Okay, so basically this is a situation where someone has advisors who have been unkind in feedback, for example, saying things like, that sounds like an undergraduate wrote it. Um, may, may I share with you a few other versions of that that I've heard? Um, your work is like a dog's breakfast. Um, stop wasting trees. Um, that's either a mistake or you're really stupid. Okay, so it just gives you a flavor of some of the things that we've heard that where that have been, or the, and then Rowena and I are talking this morning about, there's another vein of feedback, which is, this is vague, clarify, explain, and you don't know what they're talking about. So there's also that variety of feedback that does also kind of eat at your soul because it doesn't feel like it's particularly it's given in a way that's particularly caring. It feels kind of cold, you know. Um, the, another thing we've also seen, Rowena, is we have students who put their heart and soul into a project. The advisor doesn't like something that seen on the first or second page and refuses to read the rest. So that's another thing that we oh. have seen, right? <laughs> All right, well, we've seen that happen as well. Um, so this is a, my advisors have a pretty fixed mindset when it comes to writing, saying that it just comes naturally to them, so they don't know how to help me. These statements make me feel low, very low um, self-worth, and it's been hard for me to feel like I could improve, okay? But it sounds like the retreats and the work that you've done with your consultant have been helpful. Um, well, I know Rowena and I both have some some thoughts. Rowena, do you want to actually start because I really liked your your practical approach to um, yeah. moving through something like this. I think after you have processed the feelings, um, I guess it can ha happen before or after you process the feelings. You know, it's different for everybody. Sometimes a mechanical approach of let me not feel these things right now. Let me put those feelings aside and let me really search for some concrete feedback. And let me hopefully be able to list out some tasks that I can do to manage um, the, the, these suggestions and these comments. And then at the end of that exercise, you sort of have, okay, I have a task list. I can get through this. Um, attached to that, though, is also asking for concrete feedback, but I don't think that that should happen until after you have tried to sort of call through and see if there are a list of actionable items that can come out of that. Um, because I believe that that gives you a sense of um, being more mature than your advisor, <laughs> more, um, more having higher sort of um, a higher socio-emotional <laughs> capacity. And so I think those things are great in terms of, okay, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And then I can move through these feelings and process these feelings and also follow up with my advisor and ask for additional feedback. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really great. I think that's great advice for Wena to be able to kind of drop down beyond the hurt feelings. You know? I think one of the key things to remember is that when you do get feedback, like this sounds like an undergraduate wrote it, the, the feedback that stings um, and is to pay attention to what was said versus what am I telling myself that means about me, right? We don't, this sounds like an undergraduate wrote it, is that's lazy mentoring. Lazy mentoring. 
That's what that is. That's lazy mentoring. And it's really important for you to go, okay, I'm on the receiving end of lazy mentoring. Um, and, or really another way to say it is bad mentoring is like bad parenting that often gets passed down from one generation to the next. And you are often on the receiving end as a student. If you're not getting great feedback, it's not very kind. Typically, that is sort of like, that's how your advisor was advised. Something like that would have happened, you know. Um, you know, we aren't challenged, I think, as when you're in a position as a professor. There's often not a challenge and a demand on you to elevate your game, to be awake and have some kind of like, you know, consciousness, awareness around what is it like for another human being to be on the receiving end of the way I mentor and give feedback. That kind of consciousness is not always present. And what we're one is saying so important is that in a way, that's what you have to do. That's the call for you to wake up and realize oh, I'm just, I'm on the receiving end of some unconsciousness here. That's what this is. It feels really personal, but actually it's, it's telling you there's a lack of awareness because someone who was really self-aware and, you know, in a more heart-centered place, like had a sense of um, commitment, um, aspiration to really teach and guide the next generation of students, probably wouldn't give feedback that way, you know? Um, so I, I think that um, you also, one of the answers is in your question, which is recognizing that's a fixed mindset. I'm not gonna operate that way. You know what, maybe my writing does need to grow and improve, but I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna believe that I can, that I can actually get smarter and evolve. Did you wanna add something, Rowena? Um, yes, but I think it goes with another one of the other questions. So I'll hold off. Oh, okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. So let me just go up here. There's a few questions. Yeah, there's some great questions in the chat. Yes. Let me, okay. All right. Rowena, I'm going to turn, I'm going to read this one and let you start. I'm currently working on the review of the literature and finding it difficult to relate the information directly to the chosen theories. What would be the best approach to write in terms of this if the research doesn't directly relate to my theory? Um, what is the important importance then of mentioning it, right? And I'm not saying that to be flip. <laughs> I'm saying that like, okay, okay, this is really important. Why do I think this is important? You know, um, and if you just have that sort of feeling like, you know, I really need to include this, but I'm not quite sure how to loop it in or link it in, I would really just write it, write two paragraphs about the theory. Because, and this is, you'll hear me say this, if you go to my um, writing retreat sessions, um, that process of writing is processing you forcing yourself to write two paragraphs is processing the information you're processing the theory as you're writing you're thinking about oh how even if you're not conscious of it how does this relate back to my research to my research topic right and i am a firm firm believer in that process sometimes it is typing on the keyboard Sometimes it's doing it the old fashioned way, right? Let me sit here with a printed out version of the article or the book with a notepad and let me just write some notes. I am, I am such a strong believer in that processing through writing, drafting, bullet point notes, right? We have, um, we've come very far away from that with all of the technology that's accessible to us. But I think there is something about how the human brain processes that technology kind of interrupts sometimes. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right? Agreed. I think that really one of the real problems that we also have, um, which is connected to the question, Monica, that you're asking, I know I have to complete my draft. I want to sit down. And when I do sit down for writing, I don't feel like opening a page. I enjoy reading and I can just read, but I tend to avoid writing or analyzing data. 
I do everything except analyzing and writing. How do I tackle this? And I think that I, and I don't know for you, for you who's asking this question, but it just reminded me of what you were just talking about, Rowena, is there is a lot of activity you can engage in in between reading and writing full sentences and paragraphs. And I think that's one of the things that's really getting in people's way is it's like you are trying to, um, you're asking yourself to do something that you're not yet prepared how to do, right? It's like if you go into the kitchen and you want to make a giant pot of soup, if, if you've ever cooked this way, one of the ways that sometimes we cook is we open up a recipe, we do the first thing that it says, and then we're, now we're doing the second thing it says, and then you reach a point in the cooking where you realize it would have been really good if you'd read the recipe the whole way through first, because now it's kind of messed up, or you missed a detail. We've all done it, right? There's something about, let me read through the whole recipe, let me envision it in my mind. And then I realized, you know what's actually gonna be the best way to cook the soup? Is if I prep all the individual vegetables first. And don't, because then I put in the carrots and they're cooking for half an hour, well, longer while I'm still, you know, whatever I'm doing. So, um, although it would have been onions, I know that you would have put in first. <laughs> um, there, there is this sort of like, we have to step back and slow down a lot of times we're so desperate, we just want to get it written already, that we don't realize that we're actually going to make the process longer than it needs to be. Because if we slowed down and we wrote little writing prompts, bullet points, we brainstormed, we drew visual maps, we had conversations with people where we get to verbally process our ideas. We don't go to the computer and try to start writing a beautiful paragraph and a beautiful opening sentence. You know, that is a surefire path to miserable experience of writing and to not being able to get yourself to cross the threshold. So I find it's a lot better for me to sit down and brainstorm. This is where I often start, Rowena. I don't know what you think of this. Um, what, do I, what would I want the reader to know? Like what's the essence of the points I wanna to make to the reader? And I can just write that down in a rough, you know, run on sentence or just a bullet point of a few words, you know? I, I agree, Allison. And I think another strategy is, um, when I share this with my clients a lot, is to pretend that you are in an in-class timed open book exam. I have to summarize two articles in an hour and that's all I have. Um, mo many of us, most of us here work full time and so time is precious and we don't have four hours to mull on two different articles and to really think about their meaning and how they fit, right? And I found that that time pressure, right? Self-imposed, <laughs> but it, it does something where it maybe reminds us of the past, like, okay, yeah, I remember what it's like to take an exam. Okay, I'm gonna do that. And that's, that's actually kind of a good energy, right? If it doesn't make you too anxious or too stressed out, it's a good energy to just like, I'm just going to sit down here and do it. I have an hour. So I, I, I found that that works too. Just like I, I have a very limited amount of time and I'm going to do the best that I can. in yes. this hour. That reminds me, Rowena, of advice that um, one of our consultants, Christine Jones, reminds her clients of. When you've done a lot of reading, and you might want to do some bullet points, points you want to make, outline type of things. They don't have to be formal. But she says, put the articles away and just sit down and write like it's an open book text. Just test to just get your juices flowing. I know and I feel how much we just want to believe in this mythical world where we've read a lot and we sit down to write and it pours out of us and we only have to do it one time and it's great, right? But that really is truly in the land of unicorns and um, pots of gold at the end of the rainbow. It just does not exist. 
you could reach a point in your career where you've done an enormous amount of research in a narrow band, you've written and published, you've gone through peer review over and over and over again. You start to kind of figure out the system and actually writing does get easier for you. But if you're a graduate student, it's very unlikely that's how it's gonna unfold for you. So also remember it's dangerous to figure out your process for writing and approaching work by looking at faculty who've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. They've had a, it's like you're, you're, you've only, you're only in your like 10th tennis game and they're in their like 3000th, right? It's, it's a completely unfair comparison. Um, okay, this is, go ahead. Can I add to that too? And faculty write under this, press, this time pressure. Um, I was just telling this to one of my clients the other day writing finishing the dissertation when you're in that last few months of finishing it's like oh this is so hard I, I just got to finish and i have a lot of stress but i also helped her reframe it like you're never going to have this time in your life again she actually cleared everything out of her life she teaches so it's summer so she's not teaching so she just has the dissertation and she's just like tearing her hair out, like, oh my God, I, I am gonna finish, I'm so stressed. And I'm like, let's reframe this, right? Let's, let's write and let's enjoy these days. Because faculty, when you become faculty or when you're done with the dissertation and you, know, you get a promotion at your job or you get a different job, you're never gonna have that time again. And so faculty now, full professors, I'll say, you know, those with tenure, they're writing under extreme time pressure because they not only teach, mentor, they're also um, doing service for the university. So, you know, just, just saying that this is, this is kind of training. <laughs> the dissertation is training for writing later as well. Exactly. And I just want to highlight that um, it really is possible for people to develop a different relationship to this experience in life of writing. It's a very challenging endeavor. People who, who write um, for in all kinds of mediums, you know, journalism and fiction and, you know, even or just, you know, kind of pop culture, nonfiction books or whatever they're doing people who write screenplays and everyone finds that writing in some form or another, you know, there, there are people that it comes naturally for, right? There's those people who can sit down at the piano and they have, or they play the guitar who seem to have like, they seem to be like a prodigy, right? But for most of us writing, you know, it's Anne Lamott always says, writing is not rapturous, right? It's, and you, but you can learn by stepping out of the land of mythology and getting really intimate with how writing really works for you and discovering your own approach and process. It's in a sense becoming an author of an approach to writing that works for you. You can actually come to enjoy this more. Um, all right, here's a great question. One, One more of my thing. Prob Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> One more thing. Um, so Toni Morrison got up at four in the morning to write for two to three hours before she started um, work as her, 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 her real job at the time as an editor. And then also when she became um, a professor, right? And so her writing hours were four to 7 a.m., four-ish to 7 a.m. every morning. And she churned out all those beautiful novels that, that we love in that time. So, you know, it is getting comfortable, just like Allison said, with your process, with your time restraints. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thanks, Rowena. Um, so the question is, one of my problems is deciding when a draft is ready to be sent to my advisor for feedback in the first place. Do you have advice on that process? Well, there's so many different things that ways to answer that question, but um, I want to actually answer it in a way that I think is important to make a larger point, which is it's very easy 
to have a relationship to the work where we don't really own it, where we don't have ownership over it. So if you feel like you have ownership over this is my dissertation, this is my work, and I own the fact that I'm going to get critical feedback and need to make revisions. See, because if you can be writing and submitting drafts from the like, I'm open and receptive to the criticism and feedback that will come my way, it is going to help me make my draft better. It might sting a little bit when I get it, but I'm going to actively show up for myself and process it so that it can kind of, I can do what Rowena was talking about earlier, which is really get to the heart of what, what are the concrete you know, things that I can do and strip out our interpretation of maybe the way it was said. Then I think your instincts will start to kick in about when you need feedback. And I want to empower you that if you're the owner of your dissertation, you don't just have to submit a draft and say, here's my chapter two, what do you think? You can say, I'm writing to, to you know, um, share my current draft, my current version of chapter two. Let me tell you about what I've been doing. Give them a little what I've been doing. Um, there are some particular places where I'm feeling a little stuck or I have some, you know, things I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to receiving your, you know, your feedback and your mentoring on. See, because now I'm giving them a context for what I'm sending them. And I've already let them know there are some things that I have not worked out yet where I'm actually needing to talk with you about it. By the way, this is one of the ways to inspire your mentor to mentor you better. Because when, it's, when a mentor feels that their student is active, owning, engaged, taking responsibility, there's a sense of momentum and action, there's clear, direct adult communication, you're literally calling forth a better version, potentially, of your advisor. Because you're not showing up like, I don't know, I just don't know what to do here. Tell me how to fix it, right? That's one way that students do it. They show up in a meeting and say, I just, I have no idea what to do here. Versus, you know what, I've been struggling. I'm at a crossroads. I wanna let you know, one scenario I've thought about is this. I've also thought about it this way. The advisor's like, yeah, okay, my student's engaged. They're thinking about it, right? I think you're more likely to get feedback that is more constructive when you show up in the way that I'm describing. It doesn't really answer your question of how do you know? I mean, you, that sometimes we need to actually get someone else's input to figure that out, particularly if we're, we're not there yet in terms of ownership, you know? It's, it is, I just wanna say one thing about that. It's a little bit of a journey to get there. Don't make yourself wrong if you feel separate from what I'm speaking of, right? That is, um, something I've had to evolve into, honestly. I was not like the way I'm describing in graduate school, but no one even told me <laughs> that that was even a possibility. I had no consciousness of that. Um, Rowena, did you wanna say something, I don't know if you, about when you know it's time to submit a draft? I, I, I think just to um, finish off what you said, but then I also wanted to add something. Um, Allison described uh, what I tell my clients is build a bridge for your chair, for your faculty. Tell them what to do in a nice, respectful way, of course. <laughs> but yeah, like, hey, I need help on X, Y, and Z. Any feedback you, get, you can give me, that'd be great. I'm having a hard time finding an additional reference for this. You know, can you think of something that you could recommend that I read? Um, and to be quite honest, when I used to do that, I used to just throw my advisors a bone, like to make them feel like, oh, okay, I can do that for Rowena, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I knew it was something easy that they could kind of do just to loop them in, but it's all about building these bridges for your advisor, right? Really supervising them, like flipping it <laughs> and supervising them in a very respectful way. Of course, that goes hand in hand with what Allison said, um, taking ownership, but sending them a chapter, a version of your chapter that you are proud of, right? So it, it, it does go hand in hand with your own hard work, consistent work. 
consistent writing and revising, right? Yes. But, you know, like, I mean, this goes along with the theme of faculty being very busy with a lot of other things. So if you say, hey, this is what I need, I think it they're more than happy to oblige because they're like, okay, I don't have to call through this chapter. <laughs> she's telling me what to read. She's telling me what she needs. And obviously, whoa, she's worked very hard. Mm. You're also building them a bridge to read your chapter, not just give you direction on what you're asking for. You're also saying, I've done these things. I need a couple things from you, but here's my chapter. Yes. And I just want to speak to something and be direct, especially for that given hopefully people will watch this on YouTube. There is a pattern that I've seen over the last 20 years, many times with students, where there has been no bridge building and, 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 and they didn't know to build a bridge. Sometimes people come into grad school and feel like, well, I submit my draft, you should give me feedback. And then when they don't get even an acknowledgement that the email was received, I'm not saying I like that behavior, but it does happen. Um, they move into a victim. And honestly, what's in a way happening is, you know, old childhood wounds rear their head. And we start to relate to our advisor through an old relational dynamic either with peers where we felt rejected or left out or with our parents or whoever it was, we play out a whole a old dynamic of, well, I turned in my draft and I didn't get feedback. My advisor doesn't care about me. And there's no ownership in it. There's no sense of, you know what? The fact that I'm not getting a response, what it's telling me is that, that we don't have a bridge. And since I can't make my advisor build the bridge, I need to do it, right? That's, that's on me. Um, and another thing I think is, this is a smaller thing, but I, I, I see it's a real issue of what gets in the way of students built bridge building is they're really uncomfortable writing emails to faculty. They don't know how to be diplomatic. They, they, they struggle and put off writing the email, get help, right? I mean, personally, I have edited, who knows, Rowena and I to combine have probably edited thousands of emails to faculty. And I just wanna give you a few good little pointers. First of all, be gracious. Re think to yourself, there's a human being who's gonna be on the receiving end of this email. You wanna be gracious, you wanna be um, professional. You wanna say, you wanna use words like please and thank you. I, pre I appreciate, I look forward to your feedback. And you also want to be really clear and specific as to what you're asking for. Um, and, but don't give people the, don't give faculty big, long three paragraph sob stories. They, they, they don't do that. If you didn't do something by when you said you were, it's fine to give a little factual thing. You know, my mother was in, I want to let you know my mother was in the hospital. I am. I am submitting this a week late, but don't give the whole, I've seen students who've written a whole graphic story. It's not helping your cause, but be direct, you know, and get help. Don't try to write those emails by yourself if they're difficult, um, but you will get better at doing it over time, you know. Um, I wanted to add to that. I don't know if there's any education scholars here. Um, one of my mentors, he was on my committee and I was also his research assistant, was Pedro Noguera, um, almost 30 years ago now. Really, really famous guy. He was still famous back then too, even more so now. And I remember I was sitting in his office and I'm old, so email had just started like taking off, right, in the 90s, <laughs> right? So I'm sitting in his office and um, he was like, Rowena, I have to answer a few emails, but yes, we're going to meet. And then he turned around and he said, he goes, I hate it when students um, email me and they don't say, they, there, there is no formality, there is no nicety. They, they just launch into what they need. And I'm like thinking, you care about that? Because you're so famous and you know they probably think you don't care. 
And he said, yes, I care about that. And I remember that 30 years later, like, you know, hi, how are you? I hope you are well. He said it goes such a long way. And I never, ever forgot that. Rowena taught me an expression to describe what she's talking about, which is put a little sugar on it. <laughs> Write your email, then go back. First of all, please reread re it out loud so you can also copy edit it, but reread it. Let me reread this and imagine what would it be like to receive it? And oftentimes what we need to do is just sprinkle a little bit of sugar. You know, I get a lot of email every day. And one of the ways that I get myself to slow down and be more mindful is I tell myself, I want to leave this person better than I found them. My, that every email I send is an opportunity to leave the other person better than I found them. And if you hold that guideline in your heart when you communicate with your advisor, even if they do not reciprocate, take the high road. Be the person who puts a little sugar on. I don't mean be fake and manipulative, no. but a sense of respect for the, the human being. Even if that person doesn't feel particularly respectful to you, there's something really powerful about a person who says, treat me how you will. I'm going to act in alignment with my values and I'm going to treat you the way I would like to be treated. You know, you never know the power of that. There's a certain kind of a dignity in that that is will often sometimes get people to shift the way that they relate to you you know um there's a couple questions for one of that kind of go together that i want to just um one might be a comment on the question so this is a great one in organizing the whole dissertation um what is the first chapter that's usually easy to finish work upon I have problems deciding what to work on first, mainly because I'm still developing my methodology. And as a result, I'm mishmashing a lot of material sections that can go to another chapter. Um, and then there's another related thing. Part of the problem also comes from not knowing what to do first, next, et cetera. This tends to lead back to the reading um, because it's something you know how to do, which I know you're reflecting on what we were talking about earlier, where you're just reading and reading. But the, both of those are asking this question of how do I decide what to work on next? You know, what makes the most sense? And that's actually going to vary depending on your field of study, of course. But Rona, did you want to reflect back something on that? Um, to me, the lowest hanging fruit across the board is the methods. Yes write your methods chapter, write your research design. There's no emotion to it, <laughs> right? You're either doing a qualitative, quantitative, or mixed method study. How are you going to do it? Who are you doing it with? <laughs> you know, how are you recruiting participants? And I think a great thing about the methods, if you're writing that before chapter one and two are completed, is that you are confident that you have your research design you know what you're doing. Of course, things might need to be tweaked, added, you know, based on your advisor, based on IRB, et cetera. But when that is clear, that is your plan, right? Mm -hmm. I like a plan, you know? <laughs> I like knowing I'm, I'm doing mixed methods and I'm doing interviews, focus groups, and one short survey, boom. And then you could start to work on um, the items that support the methods right? Again, low-hanging fruit. Interview questions, survey questions. Are you using a survey that has already been um, used and published? Fantastic, right? Um, also getting a sense of what your department um, sort of traditions are around chapter three. Is it a straightforward, this is what I'm doing, or is there um, an expectation of some sort of philosophical um, reflection around why you chose that method? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So getting a sample from your department, um, a, a sample chapter three um, from a dissertation that's been approved. That's great, thank you. And you know, remember, um, one of the reasons that we also struggle often is because we're not talking to anybody about our struggles. 
sometimes even just if you've got a peer or a friend, they might not even be a researcher where you can just talk out loud with about your process, something will become apparent to you because many of us feel like we're supposed to figure everything out with our hands on the keyboard or with a pen on the paper, but we actually often need to verbally process in order to um, move through where we're at and figure out what the next thing is that we that makes sense to do. Um, um, okay, this is another question that's a really good question. Do you have any advice on staying motivated when you get scary personal news? Um, I've had some COVID related bad news regarding family and I'm having a very hard time maintaining focus and being motivated to work. So just wanna give a little context for this. It is uh, August 2nd, 2020. Obviously, you know, we are in a global pandemic and in the United States where many of the folks on this call are calling in from, it is pretty bad in our nation. So um, that is a, a really good question. You know. Oh, there's so many things I could say about that, but I just want to start by saying, first of all, um, I think it's really important that we um, gives our, give ourselves, and I really mean this in the most heartfelt way, to recognize that we are in pain, that we are in grief, and um, um, that actually needs some space and time in the body. And it Oftentimes we are afraid to go there and to let ourselves to grieve and to be sad because we think we might fall into a pit of despair. Um, but actually everything that you feel is waiting to be felt, okay? I know I talked about this this past week. I actually, it's become clear to me that one of the core gifts, I would say, or experiences that we hope to provide to the people who come to the Academic Writer Studio writing retreats is that you have the experience of feeling felt. You know, a lot of times we say things like, well, people want to be seen. Yeah, I think that in some ways, yes, but I think on a deeper level, what we really are wanting is we're wanting to feel felt. And oftentimes we actually don't know how to do that for ourselves is to compassionately feel that which is arising from one moment to the next. So I'll give you a quick example. La about a year ago, I took my daughter to, to Iowa for her freshman year of college. And um, my flight was early on a Friday morning to come back to Los Angeles. So I said goodbye to her that Thursday night and I had spent like four nights in Fairfield and actually hung out with her a lot, met a few of the young women that ended up becoming her really good friends and all of the other mothers had left. So they were all kind of leaning on me as like the bridge mother who was like, we, I mean, I was so sad to leave not only my daughter, but these, these young women. And so I woke up Friday morning. I didn't see her because we had said good night. It was early and I had to drive two hours through the cornfields to the Des Moines airport. And I have to say, it's probably the most heartbroken I've ever felt in my life. I mean, and I was totally blindsided by it. I had no idea how totally heartbroken I would feel in a way that I never felt in my life. And there's like no service. <laughs> so I couldn't stream music. And then I realized that I had a Michael Jackson playlist on my phone. And I said out loud in the car, Michael, get me to the airport. And it was such a painful drive, but you know, there was nothing to do but drive to the airport. And as I approached the airport, I had an awareness, which is that grief and heartbreak, it's a little bit like being in labor, um, where when you're in labor delivering a child, you have a contraction that comes on with this extreme tightening and it's painful and it rises and it has a crescendo and then it falls, right? And that that was what was happening to me was that if I was actually aware and stepped back and observed what was happening was I was moving in and out of these pangs of heartbreak, but that actually grief, really any difficult emotion 
is not occurring in a static way, in a constant way. And that my job was to hold myself through the pangs of grief when they were the most intense. Does that make sense? And that I could actually make it through this trip home. I just had to, every time I got real scared and sad or whatever, whatever was, was really just heartbroken, was I had to kind of be like, I'm here for you. I'm holding you. This is painful. It's okay. Let's just, let's hang on. We're going to, I'm here to hang on with you through the intensity of this physiological experience of pain in the body. Right? So I think that's just one piece of advice I would have for you is to, is to actually really be deeply loving and mindful of what is happening within you um, and, and support yourself because you might find that that starts to create some space for you where you can begin to engage again. And um, one thing to think about is sometimes our work, especially if we can work with lower standards, work with an intention of learning, growing, creating, experimenting, having an adventure, being curious, where we're not trying to write perfect sentences, but we, if we can relate to it in this more adventuresome way that I'm describing, your work can become a refuge from things that are painful and difficult to work through, right? And I just wanna say one last thing before I get Rowena's input. If something's happening in your life that's devastating, that is really going to require time, tears, space, communicate. Let people in your department know, I'm having to take a month reprieve. You know, something has happened. Like one thing that st mistakes students make is they have a health crisis, a death in the family, some kind of life event. Six months go by where they don't make any progress but they never communicated to their university. So they didn't clock out, right? You gotta, if you're gonna clock out, clock out, communicate, you know, then come back and clock in. It's okay to say, I simply am too devastated to work today, to work this week. If it's gonna be longer, if it's gonna start to be in the neighborhood of a month, I would communicate, you know? But most importantly is just to know that, you know, to the person who's asking this question is, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear that COVID has touched your family. Um, and of course you're having a hard time maintaining focus and being motivated to work. Of course, that makes complete sense. There's nothing wrong with that. And as, if, think of that if you can be profoundly and deeply compassionate, that you are a human being in grief, in sadness, experiencing loss, you might find that you can also hold and carry yourself into doing some work as perhaps a place of refuge. You know, I have a, a beautiful uh, friend, old friend in my life who um, she and I were pregnant, her with her firstborn and me with my secondborn. We'd known each other since we were 14. We were pregnant at the same time and she lost her baby. And after my son Aiden was born, she one day put her hand on me and said, Allison, you can talk about Aiden, life goes on. You know, and I, that really affected me to realize is that we can both grieve and also choose to say, and life goes on. And it's, life needs me to still engage with it. Now I'm not saying you have to rush that, right? But um, maybe sometimes we really do need space and time, but it is okay to laugh, you know, to enjoy a good meal, to sit down and get some work done, to still life goes on, you know? Um, okay. I didn't mean to go on so long about that, but <laughs> that's where my mind went. I don't know where went if there was something you wanted to add. Um, I, I, no, I think you covered everything and I do want to just echo that there is some refuge in work. I always think in work and doing work, I always think, okay, I, I do need to grieve. I do need to deal with these feelings, but in a week, 
are there things that I, I would be very happy if I look back on this and think, oh, I, I did take some time for myself, but then I also got this done. And that week could be like two weeks or a month or whatever that is. I have also worked with many clients who were going through a lot of different, you know, different clients going through different life changes and very difficult times and coaching them around the dissertation. And as they were moving through these difficult times, let's say a month passed, they got a chapter done. At the end of that month, they really felt like, wow, I grieved, I dealt with my feelings, but I also managed to get this done. And it's, it's hard. I'm not saying that that is easy. Mm. But it's, mm. it's a great thing to be able to do that. I'm not saying it's necessary either, but it's a great touchstone work for when you are going through those tough times for some yeah. folks. That's and it's um, wonderful. And, and, you know, you have permission to do it your way. Yeah. You know, there isn't like a, a right or wrong way to grieve or to approach work in a, in a context of grief, you know? Um, so there are a couple things. I think Cassandra had a question way back. Sophia had her hand raised. And then um, before we get to Cassandra and Sophia, I also plopped in an article from the New York Times, which okay, I think is fantastic. It came out yesterday or Friday. I love it. So if you're watching this video, you can look up an article called Managing Life Transitions on the New York Times. Um, okay, yes. Um, who did you say Diva had her hand up? Cassandra and Sophia. So Cassandra oh, okay. popped a question in. So let's read that. Sophia, you want to ask your question while we are look, getting Cassandra's question? Sure. I just wanted to, some of this has probably already been noted, but part of, I've been out of writing for a while now. And so I'd love some advice in terms of how do you jump back in? You know, where's a good starting point? Um, how to focus in that process? and then how to maximize your coach in terms of helping you. What's maybe some best approaches to doing so? Okay, good. Good. Important. You, want to start, you want to start with that, Ramon? Yes. I always, um, like I said, I am super practical, and that's how I work with my clients, right? What can you do? Um, is there a structured exercise that you could work through with your, with your um, consultant? I have different structured exercises like, okay, here are three questions. Um, if you answer these questions, it'll help you start to think about chapter one, right? Here are some of the quite some of the sections that are in every chapter one. Doesn't matter your department or discipline. Can you start to write around any of these headings or sections? And write. I'm using that very loosely, right? Like we talked about at the beginning, bullet points. Something that's great if you're doing a social science um, type dissertation, um, then that is also education. Many of our clients are in education, is statistics, right? Are there any statistics? Am I, am I writing about school discipline? What are, what are the recent statistics about school discipline? You know, am I writing about achievement gaps? What are some recent statistics about achievement gaps? You know, so those are really concrete things that you can incorporate into a chapter one or a chapter two. Um, if you're doing some reading, it is a very concrete thing to read, right? I'm reading statistics. I'm reading background information. I'm reading um, a report that a nonprofit did about my topic, right? So as opposed to getting into the whole I don't know what to call it, the whole, the whole world of chapter two, you know, <laughs> which is a whole world, right? Um, really practical things that you could do. Um, sections of a chapter, what are they? What, do they? what does a chapter look like? Can I automatically start to populate these sections? And do you notice the words that I'm using? Populate, what's available? It's, it's very concrete right? Very cold. Like I, this is just a list of things to do. And that goes hand in hand with, um, sometimes I also tell my clients, remove your feelings for a second, right? You are writing a report right now, right? There's a lot of feelings about the dissertation, rightly so. 
there's a lot of feelings about being in a PhD program, rightly so, right? But, <laughs> you know, don't, you're not dealing with feelings right now, right? We're, I'm just trying to get some concrete things on the page. And that's, so with your consultant, um, with your consultant, I, and I'm just, this is a question that we had prepared, Allison and I. So Allison, is it okay if I just Yeah, start go for it. Someone had asked us in advance, what are some tips for working effectively with a dissertation consultant? Like how can I actually get the most out of that relationship? And I so appreciate that question because it, because um, if you are mindful of that question, you will get so much more out of having um, some kind of a consultant or outside mentor that you're working with. I think, first of all, understand that we are on your side, right? So we are on your team and um, we're not your faculty, right? So you could talk to us in a way that you cannot talk to your faculty in terms of being very honest, like I am really stuck on this, you know? Um, aside from that part of the relationship, I really like to work with clients. I like to have a little bit of a structure. And um, my structure is a meeting, whether that's once a week or every other week. Um, that meeting time is the same day, same time, every week for the client. Um, for me, I save it. So if the client says, you know what, I don't need you this week, that's okay. Of course, there's always a million other things we can do. Um, us as consultants and also you as a client, um, usually it's it, the client is the one directing, hey, I can't make the meeting this week. I don't need it. And what goes hand in hand with that weekly or bi-weekly meeting is you are checking in and you are saying, I got these things done. I didn't get these things done. And I have a few questions. Right. And so that that is key that I found. Um, another thing is talk to your consultant about short-term goals and long-term goals, right? So what are your short-term goals? Those are great. That's, that's something I always ask a client when they're new to me, right? What's your short-term goal? You know, let's, let's, let's do that, right? What, what is that? Let's, let's take care of that really quickly so that, you know, it builds this momentum, um, and then also really think about what is your long-term goal? I want to finish this dissertation in a year. I've already done my proposal defense. So then with that timeline of a year, you can work with your consultant and you both know in August, I'm waiting for IRB. While I'm waiting for IRB, I'm doing these tasks. In September, I'm collecting my data. Right, so those lo that long-term goal breaks down into these monthly goals, right? So that's just an overview. It is checking in regularly with your consultant. It is um, discussing what the short-term goals are. Sometimes it's good to have that conversation every month. What are our goals for this month? What is the short-term goal? And then what is the long-term goal? And going backwards from that that endpoint, and then building in the tasks uh, monthly, weekly, but it's a regular thing. So my clients, um, once they get a sense of it, they're, they're able to schedule themselves with me better. You know, they'll say, Rowena, the weekly meetings are great. Now I only need it twice a month, right? Or Rowena, this month, I am collecting data. I don't need you. I'll need you at this time, right? And I just start putting all of that into my calendar. So if I don't hear from my client who said that they were going to get back to me in a month, now I email them and say, hey, how's it going? <laughs> How are you doing? It's me. <laughs> you know, let's touch base. Mm -hmm. so I, was that helpful, Sophia? Do you have any follow-up questions? No, that was helpful. Just trying to get in the group of things. So any suggestions is helpful at this point. <laughs> good, Thank good. You. Let me just add a couple things, you know, as a, as the, one of the owners of the dissertation coach and what I've observed, there are some things I can tell you that I think 
um, are important if you're choosing to hire a consultant or work with somebody that's not uh, a faculty to edit, to give you feedback, to give you guidance, direction. There's a few things I think are really important. Um, and some of what I'm about to say comes from the perspective of I've also watched where client consultant relationships have broken down and not worked well. Um, one of the number one reasons I have seen where it's been extremely difficult for us to be of assistance to a client and it's a blind spot for the client that, where it gives them an optical illusion that we're not doing a good job. But what's actually happening is the student won't admit they don't know something. So most commonly we see this where students come who are so used to the, the, the sort of tap dance you feel like you need to do in front of faculty to make it seem like you're smart. They keep doing the tap dance with us. And so they will, for example, really know how to talk about stats in a way where it kind of seems like they know what they're talking about, but they actually don't. And it would be so much better if they just were like, you know what, I really struggle with stats. Can we start at square one? Or can we start here? And that even if, they've, if you've asked a question and it's, you, you have to ask it several times until you feel like you take it in. I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for the stance that consultants outside of our company have but I would imagine they would share this, that we, the sort of ethos that we have, which is we are not here to judge you. You know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. And everything you need to do between now and the end is a learnable component. And if you can just be honest and say, um, this is a learnable component I'm struggling with. I'm not understanding this. It, it's, then we can really, it's like if you, went to the doctor and you only told them about two symptoms, but not the other six or seven you were having. It's much more difficult for me to come up with an intervention, a medication or a solution that's going to help you because I'm limited in my view of what's really going on. So that's one thing. Another thing I think is really important is get clear what you are asking the consultant to do. Sometimes our clients are very fuzzy in their requests or they make, they make a request and then they panic and they say, no, no, don't do that. Do this. No, do this. Take time to settle down yourself and really think about where am I? What's the best use of the time I'm going to spend with a consultant? What am I most needing? And make sure you're making, just like we're encouraging you to build the bridge to your advisor and to make clear requests and same thing with us. And if, and if that's fuzzy for you, and you actually don't know what is the wisest thing to do next, then just share that so that we can parse out and figure out how to best help you. Um, also, another thing that I see is where students continue to relate to us like we're their professor um, and we're not. <laughs> you know, it's a much friendlier atmosphere, you know, and that you can be candid and honest. And you can also think of it as a relationship where if you start to feel and sense that something is not working for you, there's something about the way that you learn or your process that's not really gelling with the consultant's natural process is don't get passive aggressive. Don't sulk away in irritation. Just say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking about how we're working together and I have an idea. Uh, of something that I think would work, work well, or I have a request, could we do something different? It's, it is an adult to adult relationship, <coughs> excuse me, where if you choose to communicate like adult and just be clear and upfront. Um, also, I'm just gonna say some things as the owner's point of view, be nice, say please and thank you. You know, consultants are human beings too, just like that professor that Rowena was describing, it's nice to be nice, you know? <clears throat> um, and if something's not working for you, just be direct and clear so that it really becomes a co-designed relationship between you and the other person. So, and it's not static. Your needs may change over time and don't expect your consultant to read your mind. All right. Um, Cassandra's question. My, yes. Um, 
it's it goes back to actionable tasks and um, generating those tasks, right? Um, I'm not sure if you're working with a coach or consultant, but that is something that we do do. Um, it comes really naturally. And so it is about paying attention and making a list. Well, no, it doesn't come naturally to the client. It, it comes pretty naturally to the coach or consultant because we've worked with so many clients and seen so many dissertations that we know that there's always something next, right? And so I would say um, work with your coach or consultant to come up with a list of tasks that you can always be working on. Um, that is that, that you know that you have to do these things. I am, if, if the only time when there is nothing, nothing to do is um, for the dissertation is when you're collecting your data and you're actually collecting your data at that point, right? Um, sometimes folks go back to looking at chapters one, two, and three to finalize those right, during that time period. Um, but there is always something to do. So it is generating a list of tasks um, with your coach or consultant. Um, part of it could be reading, but when you're reading, you have to be very specific. I'm reading this because I need one more article for this section in my lit review. I'm reading this because I'm not quite sure I understand how to do qualitative analysis and I'm collecting my data right now. Um, right. So there is reading, but there's direct reading that is directed and linked to something specific in the dissertation. Um, if that's something you need, you should just like Allison said, say, you know what, to your coach or consultant, I need a list of tasks. I need things that I can continuously do when I feel stuck. And, and it, it's also kind of sounding, Cassandra, that you might want to see a big picture, like a long-term picture. What does this look like in terms of what I need to do? Um, that's like the long-term plan, long-term goal that I talked about a little earlier, right? That is, that's another great um, mapping exercise to do on your own with your coach or consultant as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you don't have, if you're, if you're not someone who's working with a coach or consultant, again, this speaks to, it does take a village, you know, I mean, any article that was published in a journal typically had many hands involved in it, even if there's only a solo author. When you pick up a lot of the books that you read, if you actually look at the acknowledgements, it's pretty incredible sometimes the list of human beings that were involved in the publication of that book. You know, we have to start to really think about, are there people around, you know, peers, a postdoc, another professor, um, you know, someone that we know that we can start to talk about. Again, even sometimes just verbally processing it out loud can help you think through a plan, you know, where you step back and actually think about what are the different components that are going to need to be written um, it's really hard to make a specific and detailed plan beyond usually about a week, to be honest, you know, but it is a good idea to think about what's the next product that I'm trying to create. What are the ingredients for that and break those down an ingredient at a time so that you can uh, work through those. Um, I do want to, since we don't have too much time, I want to just go to this one last. Um, um, okay. Well, there's two questions. So, one is, um, how do you reconcile with not having met a deadline, self-imposed or otherwise, other than spiraling into a cycle of anxiety and demotivation? Okay, I'll say something about that. And then Mia, you asked if we can say a little bit more about why resistance is not the problem, but resisting resistance is. Okay. Um, all right, well, let me start with that first question. Um, first of all, there is actually a way in which we can get it when we've missed dead self posing we've missed um self-imposed deadlines um we can kind of get trapped in a quicksand of guilt a little grief self-disgust that once again i said i was going to do this and i didn't do it and then we start to lament the lost time and you have to remind yourself as i always like to say 
There's no cheese down that tunnel, right? There's no power in that. You can't do anything about that time. So you want to remind yourself, you know what? I did lose that time. <clears throat> Where is my power to make myself feel better about this today, even incrementally? My power to feel a little bit better about the last time is to get something done today, even if it's small, is to boldly, courageously step forward into acting and let my frustration about the lost time be fuel right? Rather than something that's like weighs you down and makes it impossible to work, you know? So <clears throat> I also think for a lot of us is that we actually just need more accountability. We need to figure out some way to feel accountable to somebody because we're, we're not yet strong enough in our ownership of the process for the self-imposed deadlines to carry weight. Also, your self-imposed deadline might have been in the land of rainbows, you know, with lucky, with gold on the bottom and unicorns. It's what we call magical thinking. So, so when you're missing deadlines, what I encourage you to do is shift into an anthropologist mode where you are a participant observer who is going to get out a pad of paper and write down what were the variables that contributed to me missing that deadline? Was it a realistic deadline? Did I have a work environment conducive to work? Have I, have I been trying to motivate myself with self-criticism? Have I been trying to sit down and just write without doing the preparatory work in between where I am now and writing? Am I struggling and do I actually need some guidance, some mentoring, some input? Do I need to set boundaries with my family, right? Do I need to co-work with other people? Otherwise, I just won't do it. I mean, whatever it is, but to start to do an analysis of like, what is it? What's in between me and working? And because that's something that we have to really own and get. Those are things I'm struggling with. So I've got to find a way to work around them, you know? Um, and if you find yourself spiraling into a cycle of anxiety and demotivation, you have to just recognize that's what's happening. Oh, oh, this is my spiral, right? It's kind of like, you're going down that tunnel, you go down. We have to, we, each of us has to start to figure out what are the off ramps out of those cycles that we get into? How do I get myself out of them, right? I mean, we hope in the Academic Writer Studio is that the way that the space exists, it sort of puts you into a bubble temporarily where you're less vulnerable to those spirals because you're in a community. And you're sort of, we're, we're offering each other a bit of protection in a way, I think. Um, Mia, just before, as we close, I wanted just to answer your question about, can you say more about why is resistance not the problem, but resisting resistance? You're going to resist working. Newsflash. You're going to resist working. Rowena and I have, we, resistance has not been uprooted from our lives, right? Um, but what happens a lot of times is that when we're resisting working, we're like, oh, oh no, I'm resisting working. I shouldn't be resisting working. I should be motivated. I should be inspired. I shouldn't struggle so much. I shouldn't feel this way. But meanwhile, you do. So why not just go, oh, I feel resistant. Like, oh, I put too much sugar in my coffee. It doesn't taste good. Like, it's just like, oh, it's really hot outside today. Oh, look, the clouds are rolling in. Oh, look, resistance is here, right? If we can kind of relate to it with a little bit more lightness and not resist the fact that we're resisting where it's like, it's wrong, it's bad, it means we don't care, we're never gonna finish, all that layer of interpretation, we just treat it like it's weather. It's, oh, let's, hey, you know what? Let me see what the forecast is today. Hmm, oh, look, I'm definitely, in the, you know, you know, 50% chance of resistance. Yeah, right. Exactly. 50% chance of resistance. Maybe you have a hundred percent chance of resistance, but <clears throat> this is, I think one of the core messages of the writer studio. However you show up to a work session, it's just how you showed up. And, and this is what my husband said to me that I thought was so brilliant. You have to work with a version of you that showed up. And the, another way of saying this is that 
if you show up and, and you've got, you know, hazy, cloudy, bone chilling, cold, you know, when it's humid and, and it's like, it's like 40 degrees and it's raining and it like makes your bones feel cold. And you're just, you know, it's like, sometimes that's just the space we're in. We're like in this kind of cold, clammy, I can't get myself to do it, work, workspace or, or mind space. We have to show up for the fact that that's the version of you that showed up. It's not a problem. If we could just start to say, you know what? This is how I showed up today. How can I work with that version? What does that version of me need? It definitely most certainly does not need your judgment. If you'd like to cement it in place and make resistance grow, then resist your resistance. It's like that saying, what we resist persists, you know? Um, Jana, you're coming in here, let's see, with one more question. Since I'm unable to work every day, sometimes I will have a week lapse between work sessions. I find it really difficult to pick up where I left off. I spend a lot of time getting my bearings, searching the files. During my precious work time, does anyone else have this problem? Yes, they do. And you know what? Rowena just gave you a great answer. You, you, what's I think probably missing for you is that when you clock out, now if you don't know that you're actually gonna be clocking out for a week, it's really important to end our work sessions if we're gonna be working a week later or even sometimes just an hour or two later to leave a trail of breadcrumbs, to write a little description to yourself of where am I in space and time with this? What am I working on? What's my thought process? What seems like the next thread to pick up? I would also give yourself a very specific warm-up activity assignment where in the breadcrumbs, it says warm-up activity so that when you go back to the work, you're like, oh, I'm supposed to read pages one through six out loud. Okay. So you, it's, we, you've already shown up to the class in a sense, like the exercise class warmed up, right? So if, you, if I asked you to go outside and do a bunch of sprints right now, you, you might injure yourself because you're not warmed up, you know? Um, the, the metaphor we always use with the dissertation coach is the metaphor of a swimming pool. So when we, every day that we don't work on the dissertation, the temperature of the water drops a little bit. So if you're going to be not engaging with your book, your manuscript, this is not just dissertations, this is relevant to any academic writing project that's unfolding over time. If we know we're gonna be away from it, time, the distance between working on it now and then working on it down the road is going to naturally lower the temperature of sort of the pool. It's gonna be harder to get in and get oriented and get up to speed more quickly. So leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, giving yourself a warm-up activity, really being, cl and, you know, being clear about how you're picking up again, it's like you're leaving the heater on so the pool won't get quite as cold. I also think just as a final thing to say is we have to rally ourselves. We have to understand that while this feels like a very intellectual and head based endeavor that is up here, most of us are neglecting that it's actually the entire package, the real estate from head to toe that's going to carry you through and that you have to be like, I am going to do this. You got to get up. You got to stand up. You've got to have a little bit of like, you know, you've got to kind of be the football coach in the locker room who is like, Allison, it's time. You can do this. This is where we're starting. Wake up your sense of the power that's in the body to move you forward. Even when the resistance, the, I don't feel like it, the cold pool is present. Does that make sense? Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming to you to our, our inaugural live coaching Q and A. And so, what our intention is is that we are going to create an entire library of these, where you'll be able to feel like you need a dose of coaching, and you can come on and you know just listen, sit back and listen, and hopefully feel uplifted to get back to work. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rowena. It's always a pleasure to facilitate anything with you. And um, I like the combination of answers <laughs> that we have, right?
you know? We, Allison and I often do workshops in person together. So we've traveled together quite a bit and I miss you very much. By the I way. know, I know we're not getting to have our, uh, you know, our little trips, our little, our little trips, like a glass of wine once in a while. We're not getting to have that in this pandemic, but hopefully we will again. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you this week on our writing retreats. Yes. Yes. Have a wonderful Sunday, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Our pleasure.